I'd like to thank the uh, London Independent Hospital for organizing this and uh, for inviting me to give the talk. <clears throat> so what I'm talking uh, on here is the um, uh, moving on from the exercise ECG uh, in response to the NICE guideline uh, that was published last year. Uh, this was the guideline on uh, investigation of chest pain, uh, and I was uh, the chair of the uh, guideline group that uh, put this together. Um, we all uh, learnt uh, as, as medical students that um, the diagnosis of angina was a clinical diagnosis. Uh, and the first description I could find uh, trawling through the um, uh, uh, internet uh, was this description from Heberden, uh, him of uh, Heberden's nodes, uh, etc., uh, which um, uh, was given at the Royal College of Physicians in London in 1772. And the reason I'm putting it up is that it's such a wonderful uh, description uh, of uh, the symptoms, which we as uh, doctors, uh, two or three hundred years later, uh, instantly recognize as being angina. Uh, and also, of course, we love the rather overblown language that he uses. Uh, they who are afflicted with it are seized while they are walking, so that he's got the exertional component there, uh, particularly up a hill or after eating. Again, we recognize that in our patients. Uh, with a painful and most disagreeable uh, sensation in the breast, uh, which seems as if it would extinguish life. And people who get angina attacks, it's a very uh, profoundly worrying symptom. Um, uh, but the moment they stand still, uh, all this uneasiness vanishes. So it really is a wonderful description uh, of angina. It would be tough to uh, come up with anything more graphic uh, than that. And of course, angina, the reason it's an important diagnosis is that it's a symptom nearly always, not always, but nearly always of coronary artery disease. And uh, coronary artery disease, of course, has important prognostic uh, implications. And it was for that reason that rapid access chest pain clinics were set up as part, um, uh, set up as part of the uh, NHS um, scheme uh, about 10 years ago. And now every hospital in the country uh, has uh, a rapid access chest pain clinic. And in fact, at the Independent, uh, we have a chest pain uh, reception area as well, if you'd like to use that. And these data are from a study uh, I was involved with uh, two or three years ago, well, longer ago than that, but which we published two or three years ago. And we were interested in how well uh, these chest pain clinics perform uh, in terms of uh, diagnosis and how the diagnosis relates to prognosis. And we were fairly encouraged to see that, uh, and this was in a cohort of 8,000 uh, patients from uh, chest pain clinics around the country, uh, that um, if uh, patients who left the chest pain clinic were diagnosed with angina, uh, their cumulative incidence of death or non-fatal acute coronary syndromes over five or six years of follow-up uh, uh, was substantially and significantly greater uh, than for patients who received uh, a non-cardiac diagnosis for their chest pain. So this indicates that these chest pain clinics do uh, reasonably well uh, in uh, identifying uh, patients with angina. The uh, diagnosis, if you, if you like, is uh, prognostically uh, valid. Uh, but if you do the maths here on the number of events uh, in patients with a non-cardiac diagnosis, uh, you will note uh, that 32% of all events occurred in patients given a non-cardiac diagnosis. That is not good. That means that these patients who are sent away uh, from these chest pain clinics with reassurance, having seen cardiologists like me, 32% uh, of uh, all the events that occur during follow-up are in those patients. So we need to do better uh, in diagnosing uh, chest pain and diagnosing angina. And it was really for that reason that this uh, NICE guideline was set up. And of course, there are a number of options uh, for diagnosing uh, angina. There's a history, uh, as we've already heard. Um, but there are a number of other things that happen as myocardial ischemia sets in uh, with increasing exercise. Uh, you get perfusion abnormalities uh, within the territory supplied by diseased arteries. And of course, we can identify that by perfusion imaging. You get wall motion abnormalities of, uh, uh, very soon after the perfusion abnormality, 
And so we can look at these with uh, imaging techniques that look at uh, LV wall motion. Uh, we get ischemia on, uh, ischemic changes on the ECG, and so we can record those during exercise tolerance testing. And, of course, we get the symptom, angina, and we can speak to the patient and ask them about their symptoms. And I've already emphasized uh, that the history is vitally important. So just take a look at these uh, two case reports here. We've got the, a 22-year-old, case one's a 22-year-old man uh, who gets intermittent, unprovoked, left-sided discomfort, often lasting several hours. Uh, this is unrelated to exertion. His exercise tolerance is quite normal. And uh, he throws in the fact that his grandfather died of a myocardial infarct in his 70s. Uh, and this uh, young uh, chap's got a, a normal ECG. Is that angina? Obviously not. And so the next question, I wonder who would want to do any diagnostic tests just to confirm that. Who would like to do an exercise ECG? Put your hands up. Okay, a few, well, three hands go up. In fact, the NICE guideline, as we'll see in a minute, recommended no diagnostic testing for this person because what do you do if that exercise test is abnormal and shows ischemic changes? Do you say, oh, well, perhaps he has got angina, this 22-year-old who can run 10 miles? Of course you don't. Uh, of course, you know, clearly, it's a test that's wrong, not your clinical history. And that was one of the key things uh, in this guideline, that one should... Have faith in your clinical judgment. Uh, and here we've got a 68-year-old woman who experiences constricting chest discomfort, radiating to the throat when she walks upstairs. Symptoms ease with rest. She's a smoker and on blood pressure medication, and her ECG again is normal. That lady's got angina. There's nothing else that could be. So again, if I ask, uh, do we need to do an exercise test or any other diagnostic test, no, because if you do that test and it's normal, what do you do? Do you say to her, oh, uh, probably not angina, then don't worry? Of course you don't. She's got angina. And for diagnostic purposes, we don't uh, need to um, do testing uh, when, the diagnosis, when the history is so clear. And so the guideline said that if angina is typical, that was the diabetic lady we talked about on clinical assessment, and the estimated likelihood of coronary disease is very high, further diagnostic testing is simply not necessary. Treat as angina. And likewise, if the pain is quite clearly not angina, somebody comes in with a knife sticking in the left side of their chest, for example, um, and the estimated likelihood of coronary disease is less than 10%, very low. Uh, just think about other causes of chest pain. Uh, but don't start running off a whole load of tests, which are far from being helpful, they're positively unhelpful in these situations. And in fact, about 43% of uh, these 8,000 patients attending these uh, chest pain clinics fell into one or other of those uh, groups with non-anginal uh, uh, chest pain or, uh, or obvious angina, which means that about half of all patients, just under half, attending chest pain clinics for diagnostic purposes do not need uh, diagnostic testing. But then we've got the exercise ECG, and of course the exercise ECG has got, as I've put here, a long and noble history. It's been around since 1942 in some shape or form, so before many people in this room were born. Um, in fact, before I'm sure all of you were born. And, um, <laughs> and the uh, Bruce Protocol that we use uh, was described in 1963, so that's before I should imagine most of us ever went to medical school. I was uh, trailing through um, the junior school at the time. Anyway, there you go. And uh, we all recognize the changes that as you exercise, uh, you get ST depression on the ECG. So it's been around for a long time. We are, we're, we're, we're very used to it. It's the only test that was available for many years. Uh, we, ha we all have a sort of commitment to it. But how useful is this test? Uh, and again, in these 8,000 patients, we looked at the added uh, value on these uh, uh, receiver-operated curves uh, over and above the clinical assessment in blue, the added value of the exercise test in the broken red line. And you can see that once you take into account the history, 
the risk factors and the age and gender of the patients, those simple things we get when we take, take the history, once you take those into account, uh, the added uh, incremental prognostic value uh, of the excise test for predicting myocardial infarction or death uh, in these patients uh, was effectively zero. And we concluded that the limited incremental value uh, emphasizes the need for more effective methods of risk stratification. And remember, that slide I showed at the beginning where a third of all events uh, were in patients reassured with non-cardiac chest pain, virtually all those patients had had exercise tests to help guide the diagnosis. So the exercise test has done a great job over the years, but we've got much better tests now, uh, many of which we have uh, available at the independent. Uh, so we've got isotope perfusion imaging, uh, MR perfusion imaging, uh, dopamine stress echo. We don't use that quite so much at the independent. Um, but these tests are all available to us. And if we look at the diagnostic value of these kind of tests and compare it with the diagnostic of, uh, value of the exercise test, and these are all uh, large meta-analyses of studies that have been done, uh, the first thing we notice is that the diagnostic value in terms of sensitivity and specificity um, of these tests are much better than the excise ECG. So why would we want to use, uh, for diagnostic purposes, the test uh, which uh, the trials have shown uh, is the least valuable for diagnosis? Why would we want to do that? Um, and what nice, what we did in preparing this guideline, how am I doing? Two minutes, gosh, okay. Um, what we did in preparing this guideline uh, was um, uh, they take a big interest in cost effectiveness, quite rightly, because uh, uh, that's an important consideration. And of course, the diagnostic value of any test depends uh, on the prevalence of disease in the population you're uh, testing. So in young, fit people uh, with a low pretest probability, um, who come with atypical symptoms, calcium scoring and uh, CT angiography uh, was the most cost-effective test. Uh, for people with uh, an intermediate likelihood of coronary disease, slightly atypical symptoms, but you're worried that they might have got angina, uh, the uh, myocardial perfusion scan was recommended. And uh, if you're really concerned, the symptoms are uh, sounding very like angina, they're a bit older perhaps and so forth, so you're uh, worried about angina, uh, the recommendation was that you went straight to a coronary angiogram uh, rather than do tests which are likely to be positive and then doing it the cost effectiveness uh, drove that decision. And here's the, uh, it's a rather complicated slide this, but low risk of coronary disease, uh, think of something else. That's on the history, no testing at all. Very high risk, uh, put them on treatment and think about doing an angiogram uh, because uh, these patients, uh, don't, again, don't need non-invasive tests. But in the middle range here um, of diagnostic uncertainty, uh, then consider these kind of tests uh, depending on the, the, the patient in front of you. Change of clinical practice. Uh, well, the key uh, NICE recommendation uh, uh, that has ruffled a few feathers uh, was do not use the excise ECG to diagnose or exclude stable angina for people without known coronary disease. Um, for people with chest pain and a low probability, 10 to 29% of coronary disease, uh, go for the CT angiogram. Uh, for people with quite a high probability, go straight uh, to a coronary angiogram. And here's my last slide. Uh, trust your clinical judgment. Non-invasive testing unhelpful at the extremes of diagnostic certainty. Uh, select non-invasive tests to help resolve diagnostic uncertainty, so that group in the middle. Um, the diagnostic value of all non-invasive tests is critically dependent on the likelihood of disease and the patient uh, sitting in front of you. And use tests with the greatest diagnostic value at any given likelihood. This excludes the exercise ECG. Thanks very much.